then thenceforward and forever free. January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation became official. In essence, it freed all enslaved citizens. The good news spread from plantation to plantation, town to town, city to city, and state to state. As the Union soldiers enforced the proclamation and the rights that derived therefrom. However, not all states were free at that particular time. As a matter of fact, it wasn't until June 19th of 1865 in which the enslaved in the state of Texas heard that they were free. Led by Major General Gordon Granger, who landed in Galveston, Texas on that day of June 19th, 1865 and read General Order Number 3, which stated, in essence, that the people of Texas are informed and in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. You could only imagine what was taking place in those two and a half years, what led up to that time of 1863. To help us to understand it all, we're going to have a conversation with Frederick Douglass. Mr. Douglass, thank you so much for joining us. It is indeed a pleasure, citizen. Very nice to be here indeed. Absolutely. Mr. Douglass, can you tell us what is the meaning of the Emancipation Proclamation? Well, uh, certainly when we received the Emancipation Proclamation on that first day of January, 1863, uh, we read it with some apprehension, uh, and we were very jubilant. As a matter of fact, that's why we originally started calling it Jubilee. Uh, we celebrated Jubilee. But as we started to uh, read the document and decipher the, some say, hesitancy of, of President Abraham Lincoln, and on my account, prudence, I, I actually wrote an extensive uh, article, commentary on the Emancipation Proclamation uh, in my paper, the Douglas Journal, oh. uh, shortly thereafter, which I tried to explain uh, somewhat his, his prudence in, in giving some states uh, a pass, per se, uh, and excluding those states, border states, uh, which were fighting on the side of the Union and uh, still had slaves. He, would give, he was giving them a pass until uh, we could end the, end the war. So it all hinged on whether or not we could actually end the war uh, and save the Union. His, his, uh, his uh, presidents was to save the Union. Ours was to bring freedom to whole millions of men and women in bondage. And so uh, I think uh, what it means to us is that it gave us an opportunity to stand up. You know, it wasn't until after the Emancipation Proclamation that the black man was able to fight in the Civil War yes. and achieve that victory that the Civil War uh, brought us. Mr. Douglas, many people would read history books and believe that the Emancipation Proclamation was something that everyone agreed to. They would believe that it's something that was a natural evolution of what would take place. What were some of the apprehensions of others toward the Emancipation Proclamation? Well, certainly because uh, the slaveholders of the South and uh, many of their wicked allies in the North, um, they had a hand in slavery, in the institution of slavery. Did you say the North? The North, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, much of the money uh, that was made uh, uh, in the institution of slavery was counted in the North by banks and such. Uh, the garments and things of that nature. Oh. The, uh, and so uh, the North had a hand in it, and the North uh, had some ambivalence as to uh, what would this war mean? What would the Civil War and what would the emancipation of the slaves mean? They knew that uh, the slave labor was all they had to create the goods wow. that were being produced in, in the South. And so uh, uh, certainly for the colored man, though, uh, I would say similar uh, ambivalence. 
Uh, there were many of us who uh, fought for the abolition of slavery, but there were others who didn't quite understand what this freedom would mean for us. Uh, and uh, certainly it might be more comfortable to be on a plantation than it would be to, to go out into the unknown land and, and fend for yourself. Uh. Mr. Douglas, we understand that a lot of these laws and public policies just don't happen by themselves. Many individuals play a major role in the creation. As you just stated, many played a role in the apprehension and probably on the stopping of the Emancipation Proclamation happening earlier. What role did you and other abolitionists play in the Emancipation Proclamation? Well, we certainly fought for universal suffrage. We were not just fighting for the abolition of uh, the black man, but for universal suffrage of uh, equal rights guaranteed us by uh, the Declaration of Independence, rights for women as well. Uh, and so it was a uh, united effort by men and women of all colors and races, especially the Quakers uh, who were helping us. Uh, I started out with uh, Mr. William Lord Garrison yes. and the Garrisonians uh, who were fighting uh, for the abolition of slavery. But I soon learned, of course, uh, from Mr. Garrison and his understanding of the Constitution, uh, of course, the Garrisonians thought that we should, we could change the nation and end slavery by moral suasion. Uh. That means by not voting and not taking up arms. Well, uh, luckily I taught myself how to read <laughs> and write. And once I read the Constitution for myself, I realized that it was not in fact a flawed document, that it was the document that we needed to, to maintain our freedom and win our freedom. And so that's, uh, if I contributed anything, was to say, this Constitution that we say is, an, is, a, uh, is a slavery document is in fact an anti-slavery document. Wow. That's very enlightening, Mr. Douglas. It shows that many people came together to work toward a common good in order to fight for the rights of not just the enslaved, as you stated, but many that you were fighting for. Which brings me to the reason why it took so long for many to hear the good news of the Emancipation Proclamation. Tell us, why did it take so long for individuals in Texas, or the enslaved in Texas, to hear and to receive the good news? Well, certainly, uh, uh, one of the primary things, and I was there at the um, end of the Civil War, uh, the second inauguration of our President Abraham Lincoln, and then his assassination. Yes. And so, of course, his assassination really put some things in turmoil. Oh. Whereas the Reconstruction Act that he was working on at the time was then put in the hands of uh, President Johnson, and he had a different view of oh. what Reconstruction would be. Um, and so those things, uh, including the fact that the Reconstruction would allow and pay for and send troops to the South yes. to reinforce Reconstruction and the end of the Civil War. And so without that... Uh, uh, without that funding, without that uh, backing from the, from the White House, then it took somewhat longer for it to get uh, to Galveston, Texas. And as you were saying in your opening, that uh, Gordon Granger uh, finally arrived on June the 19th of, of 1865. Yes. Yes. Which brings us to Juneteenth. Tell us, what is the origin of Juneteenth itself? Well, the origin is that once those uh, final... Uh, fellow men and women in bondage were uh, realized that they were free, uh, then they uh, started to celebrate. Uh, and it started to spread all of, across the country. As, as a matter of fact, many of them left. Uh, uh, unlike uh, the ones who had already left, uh, <laughs> as you might be well aware of, uh, under the, the contraband clause, yes. they had already fled at the beginning of the war. Well, the slaves down in in, in Texas, many of them were hidden there by other slaveholders in the South, Mississippi, Alabama, really? even Maryland. My brother and sister were sold uh, down South to Texas oh, no. to protect them and keep them in bondage from the Civil War. And so uh, when we finally had that opportunity for all of us to be free, uh, there was great uh, celebration and we started celebrating throughout the country. And uh, we did it in a very uh, jubilant, uh, persistent uh, and conscientious manner. Tell us about that first celebration of Juneteenth. Tell us what 
how happy and, and jubilant and what was taking place in that first celebration? Well, of course, uh, many <laughs> of you might might know the the trivial parts of it that we were celebrating with uh, uh, with soda pop, uh, strawberry soda pop and cake and and uh, dancing and music and all these things. Uh, but they also uh, took the time to be very prudent about what this new freedom meant, about what liberty meant, about uh, the promises that they could see on the horizon of having uh, citizenship and the opportunity to vote. Uh, and so uh, it was very well organized. The churches uh, were being established, new churches were being established, new schools were being established. And so this is what they were doing in Juneteenth and hopefully this is being carried on in this 21st century. So if Juneteenth was really about the celebration of the Emancipation Proclamation and the new freedoms, the new rights and inclusion that really was the vision of it, today, what does the Emancipation Proclamation, in your opinion, mean to us today? Well, uh, I certainly, uh, without, some, uh, without some education, uh, wouldn't know what your current situation about how far you have come to a more perfect union uh, but I would certainly say that that long arc of, of justice, uh, you're still on that journey uh, and that you should still be organizing and, and uh, value uh, those, those uh, rights that we added to, to the Constitution. I always, I always say to my fellow citizens, uh, see, it's not too far from my being here, that this document, the United States Constitution, is not a dead letter. Uh. It is, in fact, uh, an idea, and we can certainly add uh, paragraphs to it as we did, as I said, yes. 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Now, when we got to the 15th Amendment, uh, the women did not get the right to vote, but hopefully you all did uh, pursue <laughs> that, that endeavor. Well, you know, you mentioned that the United States Constitution is not a dead letter, and it is a living document. As a matter of fact, the Founding Fathers, as you know, created the opportunity to add amendments. And in 1920, women's suffrage, as it's known, it provided the opportunity and the right for all women to vote. Well, I know that Sojourner Truth and, and Susan B. Anthony are <laughs> shouting wherever they might be right now. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. As it relates to Juneteenth, that time of jubilee, that time of celebration, as you stated, the time of recognizing the newfound freedoms, how important is it for our generation and future generations to celebrate? Juneteenth. Well, it's certainly uh, prudent for us to do that because it is our history. Uh, and for us to remember our history, you, I, I would certainly say that the past is only as good as it is uh, to what it can do for the present and the future. And so uh, the fact that I'm here uh, giving you uh, some historical reference uh, is only as good as it can apply to your present and your future and what you're going to make of, of a more perfect union to make sure uh, that the black man is fully enfranchised in American society. So that should be uh, the primary focus of any uh, black man, whether it's um, the 17th century, or the 19th century, or whatever century you might. Well, I believe it's the 21st century now. Is that it right? is the 21st yes. century. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Douglas, this conversation has been truly enlightening. I wish we can talk for decades. I'm pretty sure you can give us so many, so many real life accounts of how our country started and we can look at how our country has evolved and still working toward a more perfect union. But I think Ms., we have Ms. Lavinia Bullock here. Oh. And I believe that she has a few questions from the audience. Oh, I see. Ms. Bullock. Thank you, Mr. Douglas, for the conversation. And yes, I do have a couple of questions. The first is, where do you stand on strategies for Negro progression in education? Well, uh, concerning education, I certainly uh, was a self-made man. I taught myself how to read and write. I taught myself, I stole A, Bs, and Cs from the young boys that I was walking to school with. I purchased this first book here. Uh, the Colombian orator, and taught myself how to read and write and become an orator. And so education is certainly a part of it. Um, uh, well, I wrote a speech called Self-Made Men. I would, I would certainly recommend the audience 
to find that speech and read the speech, Self-Made Men, in which I give a path forward to all men, regardless of whether they are the, the farmer, uh, the, the college man, uh, or uh, just a, a pauper. Uh, education is certainly a part of it. I would certainly not have been able to accomplish all the things that I accomplished in my lifetime had I not taught myself how to read and write. The second and final question is, what are your thoughts about the impact of the Emancipation Proclamation for Negroes? It confirmed uh, what I said about the, uh, the 4th of July in 1865, that this country, although uh, we do have to reconcile ourselves with the institution of slavery, but we do have a promise that the country should live up to. And that is what Juneteenth is about, to ensure that this country lives up to the promise uh, of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And we do that through making sure that our future is promising by educating our children. You know, it is better to build strong children than repair broken men. And so make sure that they come up uh, strong and learned, uh, and we won't have to, uh, to change them or try to repair them uh, once they have become men and uh, find them on a street corner or something like that. Well, that looks like we, that's all the questions we have for now. And it also looks like that's all the time that we have. We want to thank you for joining us for this discussion regarding Juneteenth, an historical view from Mr. Frederick Douglass. And we also like to thank Ms. Lavinia Bullock for her participation and the audience for you, for your questions. As we discuss the history and the application of the oldest celebration commemorating the ending of slavery in this country, Juneteenth. Please go to your history books and delve in a little deeper to find out more about our American history. Thank you.